Okay. Last but certainly not least, <laughs> we have um, Gabe Carnes, who is a visiting assistant professor at the School of Environment and Natural Resources at The Ohio State University. Um, specifically, he works within the terrestrial a wildlife ecology lab on a number of projects broadly focused on conservation within working landscapes. I'm going to do my best to keep everyone very alive and awake and I am usually pretty successful at that because I tend to be an exuberant speaker and if I start yelling into the microphone, just tell me to leave it and I'll project. Um, but I just realized something. The article, T-H-E, that prefixes Ohio State University is offensive, not because it is there, but is because of the way that it is pronounced. Option A, Gabriel Carnes from the Ohio State University. Gabriel Carnes from the Ohio State University. That's what you said. That's why people get annoyed with it. I, I'm convinced of it. Okay, and I think that uh, pronunciation is consistent. Um, it just dawned on me. Um, but I'm actually from SEC country, Auburn University. Woo! War Eagle. Um, so the Ohio State Michigan rivalry, the best rivalry in college football, objective observer, number two. Most intense college football rivalry. And then, before that, I lived in ACC country on Tobacco Road, so I got to observe the UNC Duke rivalry. And I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, and we hate the Ravens. And I'm a Penguins fan, which means that I didn't calm down enough to finish my presentation until like 2 in the morning last night. And we hate the Capitals and the Flyers. And so... Anyways, an aside. Um, also, it has been a pollinator conference with nuances of other taxes sprinkled in. And I was walking uh, back to my hotel last night after eating some very delicious pizza. And I looked to the left and, holy mackerel, there was Polly, the shiatsu therapist. Zen shiatsu, Zen shiatsu, the massage school alternative. Uh, she can solve all your problems, no more aches, pains. Oh, ah, whoops. The reason I picked it up was, and this is a true story, this is on West Adams Street last night. Pretty cool. It's not a wolf. It's not the American woodcock, which is legitimately probably benefiting from rights-of-way research, but in downtown Chicago, people with some of the most intense nature deficit disorder that we can document on Earth, monarchs resonating with the urbanist of the urban. So that's pretty cool. I didn't, like, fabricate this or order this, you know, a drone dropped it at my uh, hotel. This is real. This is on, and if you would like one, uh, to know more about Polly, there was a few more issues in the in the uh, in the uh, dispensary there. I do feel like the politician though that's kind of watching his watch and the moderators going back and forth and back and forth and they're starting to realize I'm going to get the last word, and I kind of do. So um, you'll also notice that my name is conspicuously towards the end, and even though I'm from academia and sometimes it's the last author that holds the most weight with the publication, depending on which field you come from, I in this case do not. I am here in uh, embodiment of Marcy Leininger, who probably would have given this talk, but she was giving a talk for me yesterday at a Grasslands Management Workshop. So I scratched her back, she scratched mine, and then Joel Hunt. Um, is the Highway Beautification uh, Director for ODOT. And this is sort of a hybridized um, uh, presentation that highlights the Ohio Pollinator Habitat Initiative uh, in the context of partnerships. So perhaps this is more about partnerships, perhaps this is more about measuring success, um, but it is what it is. 
and you're a captive audience until, I think you told me I have until 4.30. <laughs> that was a joke. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, we're going to start with ODOT. And their mission is as vague as a lot of entities' missions are. We have a bunch of stuff. It's worth a lot of money, $22 billion actually. It's the most valuable asset, individual asset that Ohio has. And we're going to take care of it. And we're going to make sure it's efficient and that it's effective and that, all importantly, people are safe when they travel on our roads. And we'd like to enhance our capacity to do things better, blah, blah, blah. Uh, take care of what we believe. I kind of see shades of sustainability in there. And as a 70% research but 30% teaching appointment at the Ohio State University, I get to talk a lot about fuzzy soft concepts to students and kind of turn the tables and do some uh, flipped classroom and you all teach me about sustainability. And we had this conversation in uh, a graduate student seminar and we focused on some readings that, what do you know, there's another three-legged stool analogy, right? So we've, we've all heard of this, the, uh, the social, ethical, perhaps if you get it to that normative, it's not that we might, but we should start managing for pollinate. Wow, that should word is a lot more impactful than maybe. Carries a lot of weight. Economic leg of that stool, the environmental leg, and when all three of those are unified in one mission statement, then you have a sustainable venture for better or worse. Oversimplified. What's key is that mission statements, wherever your vision quest may take you, with Miss Polly, likely to be a common thread of sustainability. That you can work backwards and you can be that toddler in the room. Those of um, us who have exposure to um, sort of structured decision making uh, in an explicit framework, that you're, you're common, if you're facilitating that, you're commonly told to be that annoying toddler. Ask why, ask why, ask why, ask why. Undress the objectives that seem to be the end and get them to get back to that fundamental objective. And often that fundamental objective can feed into a measurable common thread um, metric of success. And perhaps that common theme is sustainability. So we could have focused on any one of a number of these other partner organizations. And Marcy was quick to point out that this slide is incomplete. Right? Everybody brags about how many icons, logos can I fit on my acknowledgments partner slide. This is two years worth of work. And I, I'm not tooting my own horn because I'm in no way affiliated with OP or ODOT. I'm telling you that they have done a fantastic job of forging partnerships and they've achieved a lot of success in the last 24 months. Um, so I'm going to highlight ODOT, talk about OP, and then we're going to come back and talk about what OP and ODOT have done together to meet fundamental objectives of ODOT, same time achieving uh, conservation success within the landscape. And we could focus on any number of programs uh, from the perspective of DOT. Um, but this was mentioned in the video that, that rolled ear earlier, the Highway Beautification Act. Well, before that, in the 30s, the Ohio State University partnered with local civic uh, garden clubs in Ohio, and they realized that um, there was a uh, there was an interested segment of society that wanted to beautify highways before it was policy. And there were workshops and so on and so forth. And this is actually a picture from the 30s. Um, and of course, the, the uh, Highway Beautification Act came along there in the 60s with um, uh, Lyndon Johnson sounding somewhat like uh, Donald J. Trump. I want to make America great again, particularly along the highways. And I, and I paraphrase. Um, but there were these specific restrictions on outdoor advertising and considerations of viewscape um, and aesthetic considerations. And that's morphed over time. And ODOT, for what it's worth, is really good at building roads and bridges. And, and so are most other ODOT organizations. But here in the last five to 10 years, as they look at highway beautification, 
it's no longer just those three-dimensional reliefs on the concrete barriers and so on and so forth. Maybe it's vegetation management and these sorts of things. And facilities, come back to that. Forgot this, again, copy-pasted this slide in last night so I didn't anticipate the twirling two words there. Um, but this program might include things like litter removal, aesthetic enhancements, vegetation management. Um, I come from North Carolina, that's where I would call home. We had the Blue Ridge Parkway, world renowned. Um, so highway beautification, a very real thing, something that's tangible to me. I can put a value, I'm willing to pay to go to the Blue Ridge Parkway. And Bayer, I believe, is partnering with NC DOT, and they do a fantastic job of those wildflower uh, plants. And you didn't toot your own horn uh, loud enough. The Bayer Feed a Bee initiative that's vetting proposals right now is a fantastic program. Um, small grant awards, but really getting down onto the local scale and uh, investing in uh, pollinator initiatives. So shout out to Bayer for the work they're doing. Um, but litter removal, litter removal versus litter prevention. So this is one little case study, but I tend to think of it in five-year-old soccer terms because I have one of those five-year-olds and if you've ever watched one of those games there's two balls on the field one has black and white hexagons that's about this big and the other ball is about this big with like 18 to 24 arms and legs right and unless they can already bend it like Beckham the ball moves in straight lines but the larger ball moves in huge sweeping circles and as soon as one person figures out that the fastest way between two points is not to arc yourself around to it, but to run in a straight line, they then become the all-star on the team and score all the goals. So I'm watching this, and modern five-year-old soccer has invented a new rule, four on four. The two people on defense cannot go across midfield and engage in offense. And the two people on offense cannot come back across midfield and play on defense. So now you have three balls on the field, right? Soccer ball, wad of humanity, wad of humanity. And my little girl is better at defense than offense, but she's having trouble connecting the dots that it's not simply enough to stand in front of the goal, watch my competitor dribble at me, stop them, kick the ball out into the field of play, and then wait there and admire her fine defensive work, which it was because I'm the proud parent going rah, rah, rah. She needs to pursue that ball and get it across half field because otherwise she's playing defense again in 11 seconds. And I watched my daughter play successful defense 17 times in a row, but yay, on the 18th time, the other team scored a goal. Kind of sounds like mowing. <laughs> right? There's a lot of heads going up and down. I thought of that last night, but it, it really is. It's the temporary fix. And there are times and places and values of mowing, but this is my IVM plug. IVM is when my daughter Raylan makes the connection of, oh, defense isn't simply about keeping the ball out of the goal. It's about getting it back across midfield and giving it to my teammates to play offense, pursuing those desirables. Um, rather than just continually uh, playing defense. So litter removal, prevention, the typical aesthetic enhancements that ODOT might showcase and focus and pour funds into. It's a neat cultural wall there in Columbus. Um, these are becoming all the more common, and this is pretty darn cool. Um, they're up at the NFL Hall of Fame, the goalposts, very clever. But of course, vegetation management, and, and therein is the linkage with Opie. But I could have taken any of those other organizations on that slide and gotten down to brass tacks and found an effective linkage. So what has Opie been doing and why do they exist? They exist to create and improve pollinator habitat and to enhance awareness amongst all Ohioans. And Opie again is 24 months old and Marcy, who probably should be giving this presentation, is a transportation liaison between um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and ODOT. And every time um, there was a road project or mowing or something else needs to be done, and if the monarch is listed, she's thinking, holy smokes, 
they're going to have to build me a building for all the paperwork if that happens. So OP was a proactive, get out in front of it, try to unify organizations within the landscape to partner for conservation before it's a cling to the precipice of the cliff scenario going on. And they've done a great job of pitching this concept of being proactive and trying to unify. And you can measure success at the organizational level or at the entity level. It's another thing to talk about how what you're doing builds into a larger framework and be able to cite statistics, values, metrics at the landscape level. We do this ourselves, but we build into that. And we're part of that, more importantly, than what we're doing here as a little sort of the, the boundaryless uh, organization that was talked about earlier. So how have they done this successfully? Oh, by the way, Ohio is important. Um, uh, eyeball tests were proportionally more red than any other state. Iowa might argue, but. So what have they been doing? 60 plus outreach events in two years, social media pr uh, presence on multiple platforms. I'm convinced that the P in Pheasants Forever actually stands for pollinators. And Pheasants Forever, I would like to have been a fly on the wall in the conversations three, four, five, six years ago when uh, higher-ups within those sorts of conservation organizations started to perceive the value of calling what they were doing pollinator habitat versus, right, because on the shirt it's still a flushing pheasant. Are we sort of watering down our identity? They saw a bigger prize and that is habitat, um, which is commendable because it'd be very easy for an organization like that with a consumptive user base, frankly, that identified more six, eight years ago with that cackling pheasant than the monarch. But they have called it pollinator conservation. They've done a fantastic job of branding that as a uh, broader address to the conservation need. Um, so OPI has uh, partnered with PF to create a working group that facilitates local chapters doing outreach and actionable conservation on the ground in counties, in parks, on individual private parcels. So that's one more contribution. Uh, last year, uh, Claire was part of the uh, planning committee for this, and she was fretful that attendance might not go over. I, okay, I was going to say 200, but I was like, I think she was even more pessimistic than that. Um, I, we only have 100 people coming to this, and we rented the state fair. Kind of literally they did. Um, and 400 people came out. Um, so wildly successful yesterday, the reason I'm here, uh, Marcy gave a workshop at the Gwynn Conservation Area, which is um, adjacent to the Farm Science Review Molly Karen Ag demonstration site to where you can take people to an interpretive cabin, walk out the door, see prescribed burning, see different warm season grasses, see different seed plot mixes, walk around the back to the Farm Science Review and see how Ag Solver identified 36 or 8 acres of 600 acres of intensive agriculture as you're losing money, do something else. It's an extremely effective partnership there to conduct uh, education and outreach. This to me is, biased opinion, the coolest thing. It's probably the thing I've seen most because I ask my students as they come through the door like, why does it look like a cotton ball sneezed on you? <laughs> well, they were down the hallway shelling milkweed pods because all these partners went into the field and collected 2,500 gallons of milkweed pods from 83 only missed five counties within the entire state. And one of the partners, ODRC, Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, has been probably the largest contributor of manpower. And the seeds have now been returned to ODRC, and they're propagating those in greenhouses to dispense to one of three uh, outlets. And sort of Dennis is uh, scratching his head like, how are we going to get enough milkweed seed to do our projects? I'm not saying you can scale to that level, but this is a very interesting uh, venture idea that I think could be scaled. 
But those seeds, those plugs uh, directed towards statewide OP projects, the soil water conservation districts were heavily involved. Much of the seed and plugs will go back to them as sort of a thank you and please dispense within uh, your jurisdiction. And then monarch specific projects, a request form that private landowners can submit. Here's sort of just a small sample of the pods as they were drying. Of course, we've all, like a jack-in-the-box, you, and then you're covered in white fuzzy things. Um, this is an important step here, though. They're keeping a large number of the plugs in greenhouses for an entire growing season, so one year plus. That way, these starts are robust enough to be incorporated into a less than ideal, not exactly your raised bed vegetable garden out back, can be incorporated into a CRP uh, practice to establish reliably milkweed right off the bat. And then instead of scattering seed and hoping it's one of those 50 or 60 or 70 seeds that you've dispensed, fairly certain those plugs are going to survive and then they'll provide the seed source to kind of continually seed pretty, I, I got to give it to him on that one. Uh, NIFWIF uh, grant, I believe the final draft was uh, asked for, this is a proposal to coordinate 300 of these milk, uh, milk weed pod collections across five states uh, to fill in the eastern broadleaf uh, forest continental province and source seeds and plugs to this region. So if you happen to fall into that region, you hear that this grant is ultimately approved, this might be something to tap into. And certainly um, at various scales, there's ways to uh, mimic uh, this really productive uh, system. Um, I know I'm running out of time. Comprehensive technical document for those engineers. This is in uh, second or third draft and it's extensive BMPs, no matter who you are, private landowner to exec of American Electric Power, the BMPs that apply to you in one single document, sort of a one-stop shop. That's a project that they've been involved with, They're pushing this new Monarch safe, um, 30,000 acre cap across 43 counties, very exciting. And of course, the Environmental uh, Quality Incentive Program, 36, 37 different conservation practices with direct ties back to pollinators. Making sure those private landowners, when they call their county offices and ask for assistance, they know about these pollinator uh, practices. And what's great about EQIP, sort of the uh, uh, acronym vomit of NRCS, uh, there's just Holy mackerel, CP43. Equip to me addresses, careful how to say this, um, more of the landscape. That was about as generic as I could get. Um, agricultural producers, but also non industrial timber woodland owners, which is important because unless you're an agricultural producer, most people think, well, I can't access those CRP practices and so on, so I'm not eligible. Equip, very effective. Um, and wait for it, all this was done without a full-time coordinator. <laughs> and they're trying to uh, get this pushed through currently, um, working with um, some folks in Illinois um, to actually uh, accomplish this. So uh, OP and ODOT, uh, ODOT was a founding uh, partner. Why is ODOT? Because they provide those connective linkages between potentially larger patches within the landscape. And we had this conversation for those of you who were there yesterday morning in the science roundtable, the value of these connective um, rights of way. Um, they took a real long time to make sure they executed well on their first project, and they did. Uh, up in Wood County, I-75 project, took a project and split it into two parcels. One was predominantly uh, for pollinator forage. It was a larger plot. The smaller was more accessible to the public. There was safe parking. And there was tremendous investment in this first project because guess what? If you get it wrong, it's probably going to be your last, kind of like a first date. But if you get it right, she might pick up the phone next time. And if she picks up the phone that time, you probably get another date until, you know, you uh, 
destroy the relationship. Um, so far, Opie has not managed to do that, um, and neither have I. Um, but it's effective in your partnerships to make sure that first impression, impression uh, goes over really, really well. And now they've got a streamlined three-step process. I'd like to do pollinator work. Okay, the Nero, right? Thumbs up, thumbs down, Coliseum style. And if approved, then go to Opie and make it happen in two years. That's how streamlined that process has become. Um, I think this is a good message if it didn't come out in the partnership uh, session this morning. Get it in writing. Get it in writing. I'm learning the value of that now uh, to kind of, um, again, I'm last, uh, uh, piggyback on, on John's uh, manipulative experiments that are going on and only feel comfortable saying this because it's a different sector. Um, but at OSU, we're working very similar projects, multi-year pre-treatment and then a manipulation and then several years of post-treatment within pipeline rights way to answer those very same questions, multi-taxa, flora and fauna. Um, but having an MOU with those private landowners, you can take them back to that and remind them of the fine print because <laughs> We've all been on the other end of that before, whether it's with your home insurance provider or whatnot, and there's a reason those documents exist. It keeps partnerships consistent and makes sure that they work long term, not just when it's convenient. Um, so it's very important to get these in, in, in writing. Um, similar to uh, Dennis, Texas Dot, the educational kiosks and informational signage, uh, just three weeks from now, the first will debut um, there's an accompanying uh, pollinator garden exhibit there, so uh, we've seen this um, practice mentioned several times. Last but not least, ODOT's idea. Very good first impression, apparently. ODOT's idea, they've asked Opie, and this is now in the hands of their engineers. So again, some tremendous success stories across the states represented in these last two days of what Department of Transportations are doing. Uh, for pollinators. Um, in early success, Opie is two years old. This partnership is slightly younger than that. They've already created 400 acres within the state. Two-thirds of a square mile. Yeah, okay, 400 acres. Uh, 400 acres is great, but 400 acres, we got a monarch safe that's 30,000 acre cap. So not to poo-poo, but if you're ODOT and you're relying on your entity's success metrics and you're ignoring that higher tier that you're pumping acreage and success into, you're missing the biggest bang for the buck. And let me illustrate. This is real data from a real county in Ohio. And just watch how this evolves. Four hundred acres might get you a footprint eight or ten times the size of that picture, which might sum up to, hey, we made a difference in one township in one of our 88 counties. Good on us and, and, and good on you. But at the landscape scale, everyone working together, that is impressive. That is why the rights of way is habitat working group is important because now we see linkages between those habitat patches, literally between backyards, airports, CRP, agricultural producers. You can't tell me ag solver does not have the potential to be the next farm bill within the ag producing industry. You, you can't because no one in the right mind, I realize there's things like subsidies and market forces, but Ag Solver is a, it, it, it speaks because as we all know, money talks. Um, so 
I get the privilege of showing the last slide unless you have a conclusion. Oh, yes, all right. So I think, take liberty to do this, this is OP partnerships, but you all build into a similar landscape somewhere where you work, this exact same thing is occurring within the landscape. And you all are to be commended for that. So as uh, I, I, I'm the politician, that is my closing statement. So clap for yourselves, I, I will. <laughs>